Heavenly Father, we're so grateful we can meet together. Lord, I count it a great privilege that people will come, Lord, to, to hear the things you've told me. Lord, it's, it's a wonderful privilege. Please speak to people this morning, Lord. Please speak to me as I'm preaching, Lord. Give me revelation and thoughts that I've never had before. Father, we're tired of dead sermons. We're tired of Christian rhetoric. Lord, we need that Holy Ghost to illuminate the word, to challenge us, exhort us, comfort us, whatever we need. We trust it in you, Lord. Amen. Right. The Lancashire title is Trouble in Camp. Trouble in the Camp. I'm looking at Achan. I want to show again how easy it is to be seduced. Well, if you don't know the story of Achan, it's only in one short uh, chapter. It's only mentioned once. There's a slight reference to it, but the story is just a few verses in the whole of the Bible. But it's, it's pivotal in uh, Israel's history. Uh, Achan lived in the time of Joshua. And if you don't know, Joshua was the man who uh, succeeded Moses. Moses led them out of Egypt, but Moses couldn't get them in the promised land. He failed. God wouldn't even let him in. Unbelievable, isn't it? He got them out, but he couldn't get them in. There's something very profound there. And it took another man to get them in. You see, Moses was an intercessor. He was the one who stood on the mount with his hands raised. He wasn't a fighter. Joshua was the man of war. I didn't bring it out last night because, there's, you know, I'd go on another hour. But Moses, God said to Moses, get down. They've corrupted themselves. That was God's view. God's view was they corrupted themselves dancing around the golden calf. They're corrupt. There's a mixture. It's Babylon. The mixture's Babylon. Moses was a man of compassion. He said to God, please don't, don't destroy them. And he put his own salvation on the line. But when Moses went down, after all that, he smashed the tablets. He got angry. It was all right. Well, he hadn't seen it. See, God had seen it and said, they've corrupted yourself. Moses hadn't seen what they'd done. And he pleaded for them. And God said, I'll forgive them. But when Moses went down, he lost his rag and he smashed the tablets because he saw it. But when they were going down, Joshua, Joshua said, it's the sound of war. He heard the celebration. And he thought it was the sound of war because that's what's on his mind. When you're fighting, he said, there's a war going on. Wonderful. Because he was a man of war. And Moses says, actually, Joshua, you have a lot to learn yet. That's not the sound of war, nor is it the sound of people in distress. It's a sign of uh, the celebrating. But Joshua heard the sound of war when it wasn't, because that's what was on his mind, celebration, noise. And he was the man, the warrior. He's the one who got them into the promised land. Jesus is our Joshua. The first time Jesus got us out, he redeemed us from Egypt, the world. So the first coming of Jesus was to get us out of Egypt. The second time he's coming is to put us in. Jesus is coming to take us into our Canaan, which is the millennial thousand years where we'll reign with Christ and the, the giants will be killed. We'll smite the nations with the rod of iron and we will do it. Revelation says one of the churches, if you overcome, you will smite the nations with the rod of iron. They must be the bride. So Achan... A uh, single act of one man. Unbelievable. This is Achan. One man, the single act of one man could have changed the destiny of Israel. The whole of Israel could have taken a different course because of one man's sin. What was the sin? What was the deception? What was he deceived in? Let's look at it. Well, when I'm doing a character study, I love character studies. I don't do enough, but I love them. And the first thing I do is look what his name means. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? And do you know what Achan means? Troublemaker. Lived up to his name. He caused trouble in camp. He lived up to his name. Well, they just returned from the conquest of, of Jericho. So the f right at the initial conquest of, of Canaan, 
They went into Canaan, the first battle was Jericho, and it was wonderful, signs of wonders, the wall fell down with a shout and the blast of a trumpet, and they took the city easily. They raised the whole city to the ground. The money was put into the treasury, wasn't it? And Joshua gave a charge, this is important. When the walls fell down, Joshua said, the city is cursed. The city is cursed. And they warned them not to take any of the spoils. He said, if you take any of the spoils, it will bring trouble to Israel. You know, when people backslide, there's no excuse. You've always had a warning. You ignore it, you don't recognise it. There was a warning. If you take any of the spoils, they've got to go into the treasury. If you take any of the spoils, you'll bring trouble to Israel. So, with no excuse, when we stand before God, you know, nobody will have an excuse for backsliding. The excuse will be the flesh, my covetousness, my pride, which is no excuse, you understand. You won't have an excuse, because God always is gentle and he always warns you. And this is what he said, shout, this is be just before the walls fell down, shout for this, the Lord hath given the earth the city, and the city shall be cursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot will live. And don't take yourself, separate yourself from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take the accursed thing. I mean, that's three times. For all the silver and gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the, the treasury of the Lord. Okay? All right, this didn't set a precedent. This was a one-off instruction. With Jericho, you don't touch the gold and the silver because the city's cursed. And you'll bring trouble if you take of the cursed thing. But it's not a precedent because Abram gave a tenth of the spoils of battle to Melchizedek and kept nine tenths for himself. Many times the spoils of the battle people could take. So we don't, we're not setting a precedent here, but because the city was cursed, if you take of anything that's cursed, it'll cause you a problem. Many of the cities weren't cursed. You know, they, they went and killed the women, men, children, and took the spoils. That was all right. Uh, they took the wives as well sometimes, didn't they? They had to separate them and Israelize them. Therefore, to take spoils would be to take the curse and be contaminated. And that is the key. Babylon's about contamination. Babylon means confusion, mixture. And that's the key. When you bring mixture into your, uh, I can't say religion or Christianity, but into your walk with Christ, if you bring a mixture, you've started Babylon. You can't do it. And that was the key. It would be a contamination because it was cursed. And you can't mix curse with blessing. If it's not cursed, okay, take the spoils. But because the city was cursed, to mix cursing and blessing is confusion, isn't it? You can't do it. Because the, the, the curse, the thing they took, the gold, if they took it was cursed, it would be a blessing to them. So they're mixing up a blessing and a curse. Can you see? If it wasn't cursed, they took it. The gold's a blessing. The spoil's a blessing. But it's not a blessing when it's cursed. If God's cursed it, it can't be a blessing. And it's very serious, they wouldn't have taken possession of the land of Canaan without God exposing Achan. If you don't know the story, you'll see what happened. Israel would have been deceived into a compromising position. In fact, they were deceived because they didn't know. If God hadn't exposed it, then they'd never got in the promised land. Or that they'd have never taken it. Okay. So, how sad if we don't learn from this incident. Because we're talking about our inheritance. I'm not preaching about Achan, I'm not interested in Achan, I'm interested in us in 2014. What's our inheritance? Well, I've hinted, our inheritance is the same inheritance as Jesus is waiting for. Jesus hasn't got his inheritance yet. He's waiting at the right hand of God, isn't he? Till, till his enemies become his footstool. That's part of his inheritance. I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. So Jesus' inheritance is to get his bride and have a thousand year honeymoon, ruling the nations. That's God's, Jesus' inheritance. That's why he died. That was his motive. God's motive was to save the world. Jesus wasn't. He said, not my will, but your Jesus didn't want to die. He said, take it from me. Nevertheless, I'll do your will. 
It was never Jesus' will, but he did God's will. I please the Father, I don't please myself. But Jesus came to get his bride. Father, I'm not praying for the world. What a prayer. Well, there's a, just, I'm praying for those you've given me out of the... I'm praying for the bride because that's, that's the price. That's the, what I'll obtain. If I go through the cross, I'll inherit all things and I'll get the bride. That's what he died for. That was what was in Christ's mind, the bride. So I can took the curse thing, if you don't know the story, we'll say I can took the curse thing, but he was deceitful because he hid it in his tent. There's two sins there, first to take it, which was wrong, and then he, he carried on and was deceitful because he didn't do it openly. He didn't say, well, I'm taking the curse thing, I want... I want what I'm taking. He actually hid it in his tent from everyone else. So nobody knew that he'd sinned. Nobody knew he'd brought a curse on Israel. So why did he? Why did he do it? Why was this man deceived? What was the motive? Remember, we said backsliding is not any action. We know somebody's backslidden when we see the action. But the backsliding starts a long time before in the heart. Backsliding is a condition of heart and motives and desires, not of actions. Well, I can prove covetousness was his hidden motive. In this instance, it was covetousness that made him miss, or would have made him miss the inheritance. Many men of God fall for this temptation, even though they were all clearly against it. Covetousness is the bane of modern Christianity. Most of the preaching is to appeal to your covetousness, what you want. You want to be a mighty man of God. You want to be successful. You want to fulfill your destiny. You want to be wealthy. You want to be a man of influence or a woman of influence. That's the preaching these days. Live a holy life so God can fulfill your will. They preach holiness. They preach live a good life. Don't have bitterness. Don't have this. But the bottom line, if you read between the lines, and a lot of preachers, especially on the God challenge and those things, they preach holiness, but the bottom line is so God will bless you. And you'll be like me, a millionaireess, and you will be successful. That's not the gospel, that's a perversion. It's appealing to covetousness what you want. Anything with self in front is dangerous. Self-satisfaction, self-worth. Jesus said, deny self. It's not what you want, it's what God wants for your life. None of your business, how you live. It's supposed to be God's business. Lord, what did Paul say when he got knocked off his horse? Lord, what can I do for you? Lord, what will you have me to do? Not what can I do for you. Do you understand? Lord, what will you have me to do? All right, this is what happened if you don't know. Joshua, um, Joshua uh, asked God to expose the sin. What happened? They went to find the next battle, a little village called Ai. And they said, Joshua, there's no point in a whole army going for a little village. It's a, it's a laugh. Send a few men, they'll just mop them up. So the few men went to, to fight the city and they came running from their enemies. And Joshua said, what's going to happen? All Canaan will see that we're frightened of them. They'll get stronger, we'll get weak. What's happened, Lord? Why have you brought us into the land to get beaten by them? And Joshua was perplexed. And God said, Joshua, there's trouble in camp. Joshua, there's sin in the camp. And Joshua said, expose it, Lord. So, you know, first of all, the tribe was, was exposed and then this was exposed and the family was exposed. In the end, it was Achan. And Joshua said, well, confess. You're caught out, you've sinned. What did you do? Joshua didn't know. God only exposed the man. He confessed his own fault. And this is his confession. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian-ish garment. Isn't it funny? They were in Canaan. You'd think he'd say, I saw a wonderful Canaanish garment. But it's a Babylonian guy in Canaan. That's 500 miles away is the clove fries. 900 miles if you have to travel down the Euphrates as they would. And yet there was a Babylonian garment in Canaan. Don't you think that's against the odds? I do. There couldn't be many. 200 shekels of silver. Why 200? Why not a wedge of Silver, why not 500 shekels? Well, I'll, I'll explain. 200 shekels. Of the Bible's very accurate, you know, in its mathematics. Absolutely to the nth degree. Numbers, colours, everything is 
absolutely important, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels. And I coveted them. I desired them. I know God said don't have them, but I like them. I fancy them. And I took them, and behold, they hid in the midst of the earth in the tent. Okay. Covetousness. There's no scripture in the Bible to speak against wealth that I know of. In fact, if wealthy followers of Christ do good with the wealth, they'll be commended on the day when they face Christ. I'm not talking about the great white throne. That's to see if you're saved or not. Your name's in the book or it isn't. But Christians only think about that. Well, when they stand before God, I'm saved. My name's in the book. I'm okay. They forget about the judgment seat of Christ to account for deeds done in the body, how you've lived as a Christian. They forget about that. Nobody talks about that, yet Paul clearly said, you can have wood, hay and stubble all burnt up, utter ruin, or gold, silver, precious stones, but people don't preach it. This is to see if you'll reign with Christ. All Christians won't reign with Christ. You can't have all chiefs and no Indians, can you? There's a million tongue-speaking Christians in Great Britain, I believe, so you can't have a million ruling the earth, can you? You don't need many for the government. I reckon 144,000 could rule the planet, do you? You don't need a big government to rule the world, especially if you're in new bodies, etc. Think about it. Christians think they're all going to reign. Doesn't add up. If you were Christ, would you reign with proud, obnoxious Christians? The meek will inherit the earth. Therefore, the unmeek won't. The rebellious, the unsubmissive, will not. Blessed are the poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom. Well, poor in spirit is humility. So if the humble have the kingdom, the proud don't. It's most good teaching is logic, isn't it? You don't need doctrines if you read your Bible and have logic. If the poor in spirit, if the humble inherit the kingdom, it's showing that the, the proud don't. And, and I could give you another 50 scriptures to show that there's a separation. But a man called into the ministry... Entirely different. You can't be called a man of God and wealthy. According to the Bible, I mean, I've got the scriptures. So if you want to be in business, great. Go in business, earn as much as you can. And God bless you. Charge those that are rich, Timothy, that they do good with the riches. Don't trust in uncertain risk. Don't trust in your money if you're wealthy. You do good with it. That's not your, your security. God's your security. So there's instruction for a wealthy man. But what about uh, a young minister, Timothy? This is instructions to a minister. With food and raiment, be content, O man of God. Be content with food and raiment. I mean, that, that's a plain scripture, isn't it? Money will corrupt a man, so flee it. It says it'll, uh, men, who cover, men in the ministry who cover money, it'll bring them into many hurtful lusts. You know, fame and money corrupt you. Women fancy you when you're rich and famous. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to be like a film star. That appeals to a woman, a wealthy man, because he's capable. Powerful people. It attracts all sorts of things. So why so many faith preachers fall into sexual immorality? Because it, it's, it's a corruption. With food and rain, be content. How did Jesus send them out? When Jesus sent them, don't take two pairs of shoes. Trust me. The, the, the workman's worthy of his hire. So I'm not preaching against riches, but don't call yourself a man of God and be covetous. There's something wrong. There's clear scripture. Okay, Johnny. The love of money, not money, the love of money, that's covetousness, isn't it? is the root of all evil, not some evil, all evil. The whole world system is run on the love of money. While some have coveted after, they have erred for themselves, faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows, but you, O oh man of God, flee these things. So he's telling you to flee covetousness, flee wanting possessions and things. If you're a man of God, be content with food and raiment. You've got food, you've got clothes, you've got a house to live in. Don't seek any. You're in the ministry. If you want to be in business, great. Go in business and leave the ministry. But don't think you can mix the two. The Bible's very, very clear. It doesn't criticise rich men, but it criticises men of God who are rich. 
They've got to be content with food and raiment. Don't stay in big hotels. When you go, stay with people. Bless the house. Fancy going in a five-star hotel. I can't bless the hotel room when I'm put up in a five-star hotel room. How can I bless the room? Because the next man comes in as a businessman with a prostitute. I can't bless that room. If I stay in somebody's house, I can leave the house and leave my peace over it and bless them, can I not? And fancy, you know, a couple who've only ever seen a man of God 50 yards away on a platform. Fancy a man of God in your house. What a privilege that... I'm talking about a real man of God, a holy man. Fancy the privilege of a man of God sitting having breakfast with you, talking about the things of God. Don't we deprive people by staying in hotels and... and we all want the way that Jesus sent them out. He said, go out, I'll give you power to cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel. Everyone wants that, the power of God and the gospel, but they won't go out how he sends. Because the next verse, he says, but when you go, well, why don't they do that? There's, there's some problem, isn't there? There's some, something doesn't add up with these men of God. They want one part of the scripture, and then he says, and as you go, go like this. Don't take two pairs of shoes. Don't provide for yourself. The workman's worthy of his hire, meaning you're working for me. I'll look after you. You don't need to beg money. I'll look after you. I've never met a man of God. Root lives by faith. He, he goes to Pakistan. He goes to India. He goes to Africa, risks his life. And, and I, I don't know where the money comes from. I think, how does he do that? It's... And Joni and I go all over the world and people may... You know, we've got no church, nobody tithing to us. Listen, if you're working for God, will he not provide? Oh, you of little faith. Where's the men who, who believe the Bible and do it? Fancy becoming a beggar. A man of God becomes a beggar and asking people for money. Give to God. And I'm his banker, of course. You're not giving to God, you're giving to the ministry. When you give to a ministry, you're not giving to God. Do you know that? Never think you're giving to God when you give to ministries. Give to ministries, for sure. But you're giving to the ministry. Be honest. If you give to God, you've got to give to the poor. He who gives to the poor lends to God. When you give the poor without telling anyone, arms giving, we don't hear sermons on that, you're giving to God and he will repay. Read it. But it's good to give to a ministry. It's good to give to the poor. It's good to give. But don't think it's giving to God. Okay. That's the preachers who say that you're giving to God, but actually it's in their coffers to use as they think fit. And they're not qualified to decide, are they, when they covet us? So by Jesus' definition, these people are false preachers because the fruit's wrong. How do you know a man of God? You know the false prophets, not by the gifts, by the fruits. I say not the suits, but the fruits. <laughs> not the outward, not how they look and present. Not whether they preach righteousness, not whether all the doctrines are right. They may have all the right doctrines and be false prophet. He didn't say, check it with the word of God. He didn't say anything. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. What's the fruit? The character of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit. So if you preach the gospel and everything's true that you say, and the signs and wonders and you're proud, you're a false prophet. The fruit's wrong. If you preach and everything's right and you heal the sick and raise the dead and thousands are saved and you're covetous and live the wrong life, the wrong fruit, you're a false prophet. False prophets get people saved. Paul said, Satan comes as a, a horned being. No, Satan comes as an angel of light. And therefore, it's no wonder if his ministers come as ministers of righteousness. We should expect ministers of righteousness to be the devil's plants. It says it, Paul tells us. That Satan's ministers come as ministers of righteousness. So they're going to preach the right thing, but the wrong motive. They're preaching the right thing to make themselves rich. They're preaching the right things. Listen, if I was a con man, I, I've mixed with con men. I could be one myself. God exposed me. What do you do? You get a, the count of each perfect. You wouldn't make false five pound notes. Orange, would you? Are they green? Are they whatever they but you'd make them the right colour. In other words, it's got to look exactly the same. So if I wanted to seduce God's people, am I going to preach heresy? Think about it. If I wanted to, to seduce you, would I preach? No, I'll preach the truth with the wrong motive. Be careful, the fruit's wrong. What three things did Achan covet after? 
the significant. Number one, a Babylonian garment. As I've said, I would have expected a Canaanite garment. What does that represent? What does a Babylonian garment represent? Well, you judge for yourself. My teaching is to throw it out to you, all right. I appear as all very dogmatic and very 100%. But I'm, this is my revelation. I'm throwing out. You decide, okay. You don't have to believe anything. You decide. This is my understanding. It represents the counterfeit woman, the false church. Because Babylon uses ecclesiastical garments to denote status, does it not? Red, blue, purple. Yeah. If you're a bishop, a cardinal. The garments denote status in Babylon. Is that right? In the church, that's what happens. Could you imagine Paul in a frock, a vestment? Could you? A, a, and a collar. And of course, Paul would have the uh, purple, I suppose, is a bit higher than the others. They'd have blue and somebody else would have... And all the nonsense round and the uh, bells and the smells. Could you imagine all that? I, I, I couldn't, for the life of me, imagine it. I don't think Paul changed his dress from being a murderer of God's people to being a saint. Do you think he ch ch changed his garments? Do you think he thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm following Christ now. I better change. I better start wearing a three-piece suit instead of me I think he dressed just the same. Obviously. Horses for courses, isn't it? I, I've been videoed, so I've put a tie on. If you come and see me in the week, I'll, I'll look a scruff bag, I suppose. I may have my jeans on, or if it's sunny, I'll be sat out with my shirt off. I don't care how you see me. I'm not worried about that. But if I speak at a full gospel business men's dinner, you wear a suit. If I go to the prison, I wouldn't. I'd probably wear my jeans and say, hello, mate, how are you doing? But you don't change your dress because you're a Christian, do you? So, robes came in when the Catholic Church... Paganised Christianity, paganised the pure gospel. That's when the vestments came in. When Christians don robe, they've converted to Babylon in a measure. It must be a little thin end of the wedge, mustn't it? So I believe the Babylonian garment is covered in Babylon. That's the the status of the ministry, the the garments, the out the outward. It's always the outward because it doesn't prove what's in the heart. The garment does it. A bishop can wear a certain robe, it doesn't change his heart. And if he puts a cardinal's robe on, it's more status, but his heart doesn't change. So it's all the outward trappings of religion, and we're not supposed to have any trappings. We're supposed to be circumcised. In the flesh, it means you're exposed. You cut the skin away, a man's exposed. The covering's cut away, isn't it, rolled away. Well, what circumcision of the heart? It's when you're exposed. I shouldn't have any agendas. I shouldn't have anything hidden from God or you. It's got to be cut away. We've got to be vulnerable. We've got to be exposed. That's circumcision of the heart. But it, the, the robes, the more robes you put on, the more you're covering your heart. Do you understand? Usually the higher you go up in a religion, the more corrupt you become. Does that seem a strong statement? The higher you go up in status in religion, Hinduism at the top, Buddhism at the top, it's absolutely corrupt, homosexuality, perversion, the Catholic Church, paedophilia, child sacrifice, at the top of the Catholic Church. All denominations, when you get to the top, power corrupts and Babylonian garments, because the higher you go, the more you cover yourself. Yes, but I'm a cardinal. I'm still lustful. I'm still proud, I'm still deceitful, but I'm a cardinal. Can you see, the garments, the higher you go up, the, the better the garments, the more it covers your heart. You've got to be you. This is me. This is my heart, brother. We're one, aren't we? How can you have fellowship with a cardinal? His status stops it. Silver, 200 shekels of silver. Well, silver represents Babylon. Not debatable, really, because the statue of Babylon, the head was gold and the breast, the shoulders and breast were of silver. So it's just part of the statue of Babylon. So obviously it represents Babylon. Gold and silver were the earliest forms of money. I don't know if you know that. Babylon introduced promissory notes and money. 
uh, the old Babylonian Empire, and uh, gold and silver were the earliest forms of money. In fact, they're the only forms of money. Did you know that? There's banker, J.P. Morgan, you know the great bankers of America. J he said, gold and silver are money, everything else is credit. A pound note isn't money, it's a promissory note. I promise to pay the bearer on the man. It's worth nothing. It's not worth it. Gold's worth something. That's why we used to have a gold sovereign. It was the, the weight of gold. Now it's a promise that they'll pay you and the gold has to back it up. So only gold and silver is real money in this world. That's why the Rothschilds own three quarters of the world's gold. That's why the Bank of England has none and America has none. Fort Knox is empty. It's all gone. It's been filtered away. The bankers own the gold now. But it's a dual symbolism, I won't go into it, everything's dual. Lion, what does that represent? Depends how you're feeling. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, no, no, no. The devil goes around like a roaring lion. Be careful with your symbolism. There's always the two sides, isn't there? The, the, the communion, it's the cup of the blessing. That's the cup of the wrath of God as well, poured out without measure. Be careful with your symbolism. There's always the two sides, isn't there? God uses it and the devil uses it as a counterfeit. So, temples in, uh, sorry, vessels in the temple were silver. But pagan statues were silver, did you know? As well as in the temple. This is from uh, Judges. This was a man. Forget the story, it doesn't matter, it's about Micah. Yet he restored the money to his mother, and his mother took him 200 shekels of silver. Did you know that was 200 shekels of silver? What was it for? And gave them the founder who made a graven image and a molten image. Achan coveted 200 shekels of silver. It's the price of an idol. 200 shekels of silver to make an idol. It's not by chance it's the same amount in the Bible. The Bible doesn't... Mess about, does it? If it says 200 shekels, look for another 200 shekels in the Bible. The price of an idol. Babylon's all about image worship. That's what Babylon's about. Worshipping the creation instead of the creation. It may be worshipping the man of God. It may be the golden calf. It may be the beautiful church you've built. But it's always worshipping through a mediator other than Jesus. An image. And to... Coveting 200 shekels of silver, he was coveting another way to God, not a direct way through silver. Wanted the status of religion. He, get it, he wanted to get Israel into Babylon. Satan did, and he used Achan to do it. All the symbols, Babylonian garment, the status of religion, an idol, a false god. Demetrius, the silversmith, do you remember the Acts of the Apostles? He lost his trade. A silversmith, what did he do? He made idols for the Ephesians. Was it Ephesians? Yeah. For Diana. Diana's the same god as Isis, Columbia, Britannia. Every empire has a different name for the same god. There's only Nimrod, Semiramis and Talmud. There's only the three, isn't there? But throughout history, the Romans call it Jupiter and the Greeks call it this and we could say Britannia. Same, same God. Britannia rule away. We've asked that God yeah. to rule Britain. It doesn't say Britannia rules the waves. It says Britannia rule the waves. It's a plea. Our national song is a plea for a, a demon God to rule Britain. Britannia rule the waves. Rule, not rules. I've said a lot of these things in the, the Babylon books. Okay. Gehazi coveted silver and garments. Not by chance, is it? Remember, Elisha, heal Naaman. And Naaman says, oh, I want to give you some gifts to bless you. And there was nothing wrong with that. Sometimes the prophets did take the gifts. But this time he said, no, I don't want to take anything. And Gehazi thought, the fool, we could do with some money, we could do with, we're short. And so when, when Elisha wasn't looking, he ran to the man to Naaman, and he said, actually, there's a couple of prophets coming. He was lying. Uh, Give me two, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. There we are again, the garments and the silver. The, the religion coming in, he wanted to bring it in. So I think 
you know, I bring, hope I bring, brought enough scriptures to, to make a case rather than just an obscure scripture. I'm bringing one or two scriptures for you to think about. Silver's betrayal money. There's a lot about silver in the uh, scripture. It's betrayal money. Perhaps the most important symbol. Joseph was betrayed for 20 pieces of silver. It's betrayal money. Achan, by coveting the silver, was betraying Israel. Can you see all the symbolism of this one little act? He coveted it, impulsive act. I'll steal it and I'll hide it in my tent. It was prophesied what was in the heart of man to bring Israel into Babylon. 20 pieces of silver. And what about Jesus? Judas coveted with them for 30 pieces of silver. So it's betrayal money. My dad used to say silver's redemption. It's redemption money as well, the silver shekel. Redemption. There's lots of things about it. I'm looking at the bad symbol of it. There's good and bad with silver, isn't there? I was showing you that this was bad. So when Achan coveted the silver, betrayal, but he betrayed himself, his family, his tribe, the whole of Israel. Babylon was trying to infiltrate the holy wife of God. It's all about adultery. You've played the whore. Israel were God's wife and he uses a symbol of a man and a woman and sexuality. It's all through the Bible. The serpent beguiled Eve. It's the same Hebrew word as a sexual seduction. Beguiled, seduced. God always uses those terminology. Because when you love somebody else other than God, it's spiritual adultery. So he said to us, you've prayed the whore because you've gone with other gods. You worship Molech. And so Satan was trying to infiltrate the wife of God, impregnate God's woman to bring forth the bad seed. So he was a weak man and he deceived and brought a whole nation into slavery into Canaan, he would have done, because they ran from their enemies because of that. He brought trouble to the camp, and if he hadn't been exposed, they'd have ran from every enemy. Unless they overcame that, unless you deal with that sin, a little trouble now saves a lot of trouble later. Many a church split could have been saved if we'd have dealt with the problem early, but we don't see it. We need to learn, don't we? A very grievous and serious sin, by coveting silver, he was bringing idol worship instead of worship to God. No wonder he had to be destroyed with all his family and his belongings. You can't court Babylon without serious consequences. You cannot covet in the ministry without serious consequences. For yourself, your family, the church, the bride of Christ. Take the warning seriously. Don't court Babylon. Don't court the status, the religious status. Well, I'm a pastor, I'm a... Do you know how Paul opened his letters? We say Apostle Paul, don't we? We're Apostle... We have a friend, Apostle George, and that's what he wants to be called, Apostle George. But it's wrong. It's George the Apostle. It was never Apostle Paul in the Bible. In fact, Paul opened his letters, Paul, a servant and an apostle. Paul, a bond servant, Paul, and Paul... What I do is apostleship. I'm Morris, the teacher. I'm just Morris, but I teach. I'm not teacher Morris. There's no status. In the world, we need status. Doctor so-and-so. Great, and put the letters after your name, because that's all the world recognises that. But we're the body of Christ, so we shouldn't be recognised titles and names, should we? It's root the missionary, and, and so-and-so, and, and if, if that's his secular thing, Stuart the doctor, or... So and so the midwife and Morris the teacher. It's just what I do. It's not a title. It's not a status in the kingdom. So a teacher doesn't wear a blue shirt and a, an apostle a red shirt. Well, that's silly, isn't it? Isn't it pathetic how the church loves status? And Jesus slates it. He slated the Pharisees because of the status. You love the uppermost seats in the synagogue. You love the praise of men. It's pathetic. We've got so much teaching in the New Testament and the church won't look at it and do it. Why don't they just look at it and say, oh, well, we better get rid of this and we better... They can't. They can't. They're trapped. Very seductive, you know. Very, very hard. You, you tell a pastor and he'll say, yeah, you're right, but he won't change. He knows it's right, but he has no power to change. Been seduced. It's when you're trapped. You have an affair with a woman and, you, and your wife challenges you. You know it's wrong. Not easy to stop. That pull... That lust has got there and it's hard. Start gambling. You know it's wrong. You know you're spending your wife's shopping money. You know your business is going down. But can you stop it? 
Listen, when you get seduced, there's a power over you. Mammon is a power. There's many powers in the world. And mammon, the love of money, is a power. Covetousness is a power. And even when you know you're wrong, you can't get out without deliverance. And the only way this man could get out was to cut the cancer off. He had to be destroyed. The last one, the wedge of gold. Gold's the ultimate symbol of wealth. Don't remember, don't forget, or remember, the head of Babylon is gold. The statue, the head of Babylon is gold. That statue of Babylon is just a timeline of Babylon. The Greeks and the Persians were Babylon. The Roman Empire was Babylon. It's part of the statue of Babylon. We think it's another one, but it's just part of the statue. It's the timeline. So we're still under the Roman Empire now, aren't we? The One World Church, the Catholic Church, is, is the Roman Catholic Church. It, it tells you it's Babylon. It said it's Rome. That's the statue of Babylon. And it was the head. And Nebuchadnezzar made a whole statue of gold. He was the head, but he made a, and said, worship the gold. It's the power for control of governments, business, religion. It's not by chance the biggest religion in the world, the Catholic Church, are the wealthiest of all. It's not by chance. If you're not sure how wealthy they are, read a book by Avro Manhattan, The Vatican Billions. It was written in 1975. And it talks about the Vatican Billions, how they own most of Manhattan and how they... You wouldn't believe the businesses they own, including brothels and all sorts of businesses. You wouldn't believe what the Catholic Church control. Gold as a good symbol speaks of the glory of God. Gold, the glory of God. There must be a counterfeit. So the bad gold is the glory of Satan. It's, Satan has a glorious church. It's counter, Babylon is Satan's glorious church. It's gold, but it's counterfeit. The whole world will belong to Babylon soon and worship him. Whether the statue that the Antichrist will raise, you know that there's, it's going to happen again, what happened in Babylon, in Daniel's time. Daniel's was just a prophecy of what will happen in the end days. He raised the statue and said, worship it. The whole world, 127 provinces. So the whole of the known world came and worshipped the statue. Revelation 13, I saw another beast, not the man of sin, not the one world dictator. Christians are looking for one man, the Antichrist, the man of sin. There's two, because there's a woman... And the beast she rides upon. The beast isn't the woman and the woman isn't the beast. The woman is the false church, isn't it? The Antichrist. The beast is the man of sin, the one world dictator. So there's two. But the second one, which is Antichrist, the false prophet. Jesus was the ultimate prophet. Was He came as a prophet. He dies as a prophet. He didn't come as king. He didn't come as uh, high priest. He came as prophet. He's now high priest and he will be king when he returns. Amen. And it says, Antichrist deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles which he did. Say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So the Antichrist can't be the beast, can he? Because the Antichrist says everyone should make an image to the beast or he make an image to the beast and they get everyone to worship it. Okay. The beast is the one who had the wound by the sword and died and lived again. The Antichrist is always the false Christ. Leader of the false church. So the conclusion, gold, silver and Babylonian garments represent pure and simply religion over relationship. That's the key. Achan wanted really, he didn't want the true God. Just like Israel as a nation didn't want the true God, they wanted the golden calf. As they were, isn't it amazing how at beginnings there's this seed? They'd just come out of Egypt and Satan got in the golden calf. 40 years later, they're just getting in the promised land. There it is again. Exactly, it's the same in every revival, every move of God. Even when they redeemed two and a half million out of Egypt, there's the golden calf to seduce them. As soon as they get in the promised land to get their inheritance, Achan. And it's always religion over relationship. We have relationship. 
over everything. Not relationship over religion, it's just relationship over everything. We have a relationship with God and you can't mix the two. If you have a relationship with the real God, you don't need religion. And if you've got a religion, it hinders relationship with the real God. You may be saved, you may know the real God or know of him. You may know all your doctrines, but your religion, every more religious you get, the more it hinders a true relationship. Protocols. In love, there's no protocols, is there? When I want to be intimate with my wife, I don't go through a protocol and think, well, first I say, excuse me, darling, this and, well, I better make her a cup of tea and I better do this and I better do that. You just do what you need. A man does what he needs to do, doesn't he? To, to possess his woman. There's no, and what I did last week won't work this week. It's different every time. Relationships are moving target. It's scary. Relationship with God is scary because God is a moving target. Yes, but I prayed this prayer and a miracle happened. And, and now I prayed the same prayer and I've got the same faith that nothing happened. Well, join the real world. God's a moving target. He's a personality. He's not a statue. If he's a statue, if God's a doctrine, if God's a statue, if God's a fixed thing and there's formulas, every time you pray in a certain way, you'll get the same results. But you see, I'm a personality. I don't feel the same every day. I'm wonderful with my wife. We go to bed wonderfully happy and I wake up and I'm like a bear with a sore head. Or she is. What happened? In the night, all I did was sleep, for goodness sake. And I wake up and where's the romance now? Where's the love? She's moaning that the toast has been burnt. Or I'm moaning that there's no key for me. You see, it's a moving relationship. That's why people don't want relationship. You've got to work at it. It's not easy. It's not constant. It's not fixed. There's no formulas to relationship. It's not safe. I could lose my wife if I don't look after her. Some man will go and steal her. You've got to look after your wife. You've got to protect her. It's, it's hard work, isn't it? In relationship. Well, it's hard for me and I think it's harder for my wife. It's not, not easy relationship. We have a wonderful relationship. I'll tell you what, you've got to work at it. And every few years you think, oh, I've left my first love. I better get it back. Something's gone. Because I don't want to live with a woman. I, I can pay somebody to clean my shoes and wash my clothes. And, you know, in the world I can pay for sex if I want. I mean, everything's available without love, isn't it? A woman can even have a baby now. She doesn't have to love a man. She can artificially inseminate herself. So you, so that's why they do it. They don't want the cost of relationship. And it's the same with Christians. It's, it's too easy. Just let's go to church and let's... They don't want relationship, intimate, deep relationship. There's two costs. And God's a moving target. Preach a, preach a formula that will work. Well, I'll give you one. Put £100 in the box and I'll pray and God will never touch your children again. Oh, that's what they pray. Yeah. Think of us lying formulas. I'll pray that the devil will never touch your family again. And silly Christians send three hundred dollars because they don't want they want the children to have a happy life. They lie as they con men. There's no formulas with God. It's relationship. There's no formulas in relationship. All right, that's not in the thing, but I got carried away. When a person or a church or a denomination lose their intimate relationship with God, religion takes over. Every revival, relationship, love of God, all that matters is God. And then we start playing, well, we need a secretary, you know. We've got 50 now. We need a treasurer. You know, we need to, to be above board and we need a treasurer. And uh, how can we grow the church? Let's get a church growth seminar. Let's bring that man. He's grown a big church. And we bring business in the church and finance. And, and we've got Babylon, the beginnings. So let me come to an end. What did God say about the situation? Israel hath sinned, not Achan. You know, if one member suffer, we all suffer. If you've got somebody in your church with cancer, the church has cancer. Or oh, poor so-and-so, they've got cancer. Are you not members of the same body? Oh, I wonder if they've sinned. I wonder if they've... If one member suffer, you all suffer. Are we a body or not? If you're having a hard time, I'm having a hard time. I better put my arm around you. I better help you out. 
Because we're a body. Steve set the tone for the conference. We, we, we must have that unity. We must love one another. We must sacrifice for one another else we're not the body. I've learnt a little bit from Steve about the body. And, you know, when you have a cut or something, then the whole body will organise to rush to that part to heal it. Why don't we... Why don't you study the human body as an analogy, an analogy of the church? When one part's cut, the whole of the body will jump. I don't know how many things, but there's so many systems in your body. Maybe 20 systems, the nervous system, the, the blood system, the, all these systems, and you shoot adrenaline and, and drugs, and, and all these things happen because one part's got damaged. Why aren't we like that with each other? Why don't we care about each other? What's wrong with it? The body of Christ. Oh, so and so's got cancer. We better pray for him. I wonder if he'll get healed. The church has got cancer. It's in the body. Do you understand? Think about those things because there's no point saying we're the body of Christ. We're all one when we're not. Let, let's let's be honest and say, well, we're not really. I can't stand him yet. I've got to work on that. Or else, let's change. But let's be honest. All I ask is we're honest as Christians. I don't mind where you're at, it's none of my business. I'm struggling for my own relationship with my wife, with you, with God. It's you and God, I can't help you. I can only encourage you. But be honest, that's all I ask of Christians. That if we come to this fellow, let's be honest. And if you're having a bad time, don't say you're wonderful. Say I'm on the floor. And then we'll put our arms around you. We don't need all that, do you? It's only the same. My nose is running, but I've not got a cold, it's just the symptoms. Just be honest, say I've got a rotten cold. Okay, just, you know, I'm on the floor. I've had a bad week and I'm, actually, I'm, I'm a broken man. How can you be healed unless you accept the fault? God can't do anything in your life until you accept you've got it. If you're broken and pretend you're not, God can't heal the brokenness. Confession's the beginning of change. Israel has sinned. The whole nation sinned because of one little man. And they've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, the taking of the accursed thing, and dissembled. I didn't know what that word meant. Maybe you all do. I don't do crosswords. I don't have time. I love them, but I don't have time. But do you know what dissemble means? I had to look it up. Okay. I'm being honest. It means to deceive or control, control the truth. Truth. He said you've sinned and you've dissembled. You've hidden the truth. And this is what happens when a person leans towards Babylon. You cover it and then you start to cover up. When men are being seduced and deceived, they start to deceive others. He deceived the whole of Israel. They didn't know. And they don't reveal the direction they're going in. Hey, do you think Achan would have stopped there? The next conquest, a bit more gold, a bit more religion, a bit more silver. It wouldn't have stopped. But you don't reveal. He hid it in his tent. And after a few years, he'd have a, an extra tent <laughs> To store all his goods, he wouldn't reveal it. Examples. I don't like naming names, but th th these, these, these men have, have said it themselves, so I'm not gossiping, all right. Ulfa Ekman, I don't know if you know him, a great Swedish pastor. Everyone respected him. He's now joined the Catholic Church, but he shocked his members. He's become a Catholic. He told his members on Sunday morning, few months ago, he said, I've become a Catholic. They didn't know. He was going towards Rome. He must have been deceived, but he was deceiving others. He would deceive his own congregation. And he stood up and shocked his congregation. He said, I've become a Catholic. He, he was a great charismatic leader. He, he founded a Bible school. He had churches all over. We're talking about a big ministry here. Don't criticise him. Pray for him. Pray for him. Kenneth Copeland, he had the uh, Tony Palmer, didn't he? Come and have a message from the Pope, check it on YouTube, proving that we're all Catholics in Kenneth Copeland's ministry. If you've not read it, uh, not seen it, uh, you should look at it. Tony Palmer, a bishop, he's a, a Catholic and an Anglican. He's got an Anglican ministry, but he's been a friend of the Pope, Pope Francis, for a long time. And he said, you're all Catholics because the Reformation was about the just shall live by faith and faith alone. 
So everyone says, hey, man, there was a lot more things than that as it happens, but, you know, faith alone. He said, well, actually, the Catholic Church in, and he quotes a encyclical or whatever the, I don't know what it was, papal bull or something, but he said they've now decided that salvation is by faith alone. The Catholic Church have accepted that salvation is by faith alone. He said, so you have nothing to protest against. Very subtle. We've, you have nothing to protest against, you're all Catholics. Because there was only the Catholic Church, wasn't there? For a thousand years, and then Martin Luther protested. Well, the Catholic Church now accepts it's by faith alone, so you have nothing to protest against, so you may as well all be Catholics, you are. There's only one church, no salvation outside the Catholic Church, is there? According to the Pope. And so Kenneth Copeland is now suggesting that all his members become Catholic. Kenneth Coleman will influence millions. The greed of Achan is the spirit of Balaam. It's the same covetousness. <laughs> Keeps cropping up in the Bible. And it's using the ministry to gain wealth and success and status. And it's all about covetousness. That's the spirit of Balaam. It's all through the Bible. It doesn't mention Achan again, but he had the spirit of Balaam. Jude, warning, the whole of Jude's about warning against false prophets. Woe unto them, they've gone the way of Cain. I've got teachings on what the way of Cain is. That they've ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. They loved the rewards of the power of God of having the gifts of the Spirit. And they perished in the gainsaying, the rebellion of Korah. I've got teachings on those three in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Johnny? Did you know that covetousness is idolatry? Idol worship? Paul says so, Colossians. They always go together, mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Would you ever think that it's idolatry? Well, what's the idol? You. I want what I want. I'm God and I want money and I want status and I want you become the idol. If you don't worship God, you'll worship yourself. Maybe through a golden calf, maybe. But you want what you want. And covetousness, I want a car from God. I want this, I want. When you say I want your covetousness, and you are the idol, because idols have to be worshipped and satisfied. There's no idol in any religion that people don't bring money. Steve was telling us in Thailand, they bring bananas to the, to the Buddhist gods, don't they? They bring bananas and leave them. And the bananas go rotten. The gods don't eat them. They go the next day and the bananas are rotten. They've rotted, so they put them away and put new bananas there. Ridiculous. The god didn't even eat them. But they present. Gods need worship and God needs gifts. And present, every god needs a gift. And when you become God, you need a gift. You, I need satisfying. That's the spirit of Babylon. I need my status, I need money, I need, I need. It's idolatry and you are the idol. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Strong word, isn't it, from Paul? So it was vital the spirit didn't take control. His whole family, his cattle, his goods were stoned and then burnt with fire. That, that's unbelievably ruthless. His family, his cows, his chickens, the budgie, the cat, all his animals, everything he possessed that was living was stoned, including his children who were innocent. And then everything was burnt with fire. Because God set in a precedent at the beginning. When Israel were going in, uh, were coming out of Egypt to the golden calf, God was going to destroy the whole of Israel, two and a half million people. Moses' intercession stopped it. But still 3,000 died in the plague. God sent the plague and 3,000 died. And there was a big slaughter. Aaron said, stand by me. Who wants her? Moses said, run through the camp. And they went through the camp, killing their own brothers, slaying people. As well as the plague that killed 3,000. Sorry, 3,000 were killed by the, the priests, by Aaron. And the plague, we don't know how many it killed. If it's a plague, you could expect a few thousand. And at the beginning, God's ruthless at the beginning. God doesn't do it every time, you know. God doesn't do it. He won't do it with you. He set a precedent. It's in the Bible. You know the principle that the beginnings are very important. And when revival comes, people drop dead. 
goes very ruthless when the fire falls at the beginnings. He's setting the president, don't touch my anointing, don't do this. Afterwards, God leaves it because it kills so many people. He's setting a precedent, and this was a precedent. So they were taken to the Valley of Achor. Achor means trouble. Whenever this spirit comes into the church on a person's life, there's trouble in the camp. So let's be ruthless when we see it creeping into our lives. Start with yourself. When you see that, when you're seeking a little bit of status, we could do with more money. My friend Johan Marsbach in Holland, when people said, oh, Brother Marsbach, he had 60 full-time workers, a great man of faith, wasn't he? Built 14 churches in Holland. And when, you know, people said, Mr. Marsbach, we have no money for that. He said, we, he said, we don't need money. You need faith. You don't need more money. You need more faith. Money's never the problem. Money's never your problem. If you think money's your problem, it's not. You need more faith or you need to sort your life out if you're reckless with it. Money isn't a problem. Money's never a problem, especially if you're a Christian. So let's be ruthless. Okay, Johnny. Little foxes spoil the vine. The little foxes, not the lions, the roaring lion you run from. The little foxes spoil the vine. When you're asleep... That's when the foxes come. You don't know. Don't worry about the lion. You'll hear him roaring. You'll run a mile. But when you're asleep, the little foxes come and start nibbling at the vine. At the roots, you know what I mean? And then you wonder why there's no fruit. Because somebody's been nibbling at the roots. The devil never goes for your fruit. He goes for the root and stops the fruit. Do you understand? Because the fruit comes later. If he can get with the roots, you don't know. Because fruit's seasonal. And when the time of the fruit comes, there's none on the fig tree because somebody's dealt with the roots. That's why Jesus withered it up from the roots. He didn't just wither the fruit, the figs. It was withered up from the roots because the roots were the problem. There was no fruits. Okay. So, I've finished. I use that script, the little foxes spoil the vine, because the next study is about Jezebel who's after God's inheritance, wants to steal the vineyard. So let's have a break, have a coffee. We're running a bit behind. I'll try and catch up. <laughs>